Students of Modern India as our guest, Tanika, Professor Tanika Sarkar. She is influential through her academic writings that link up in innovative ways the thematic fields of gender, religion, and nationalism politics. Um, I just mentioned a few of her books, and I've brought some for those of you who want to have a look at them after the talk. Uh, the Politics of Protest, Bengal, 1928-1934, which was published in 1987. Uh, various important collections of essays, for instance, Hindu Wife and Hindu Nations, 2000, Rebels, Wives and Saints, 2008. And there are several important, uh, important edited volumes. I just mentioned the two-volume collection, Women and Social Reform in India, 2008, uh, jointly uh, edited uh, with... Uh, Professor Shumit Sarkar, who is also here today. She is also influential um, as an academic teacher at several outstanding higher education institutions, as Stevens College in Delhi, University of Chicago, and most significantly, the Center for Historical Studies of Jawaharlal Nehru University. She is influential as a historian who actively and critically engages with India's present against aggressive politics of the Hindu right and the persecution of Indian Muslims. The booklet Saffron Flags and Khaki Shorts, jointly edited with colleagues in 1993, was not only courageous but also hugely, uh, a hugely important intervention into India's public debate. And more recently, against ruthless land acquisitions by the Indian state for purposes of industrial expansion, uh, presently pursued by all major political parties in India, including the mainstream left. Seems as we would like it to be, will promote critical, historically informed, but presently relevant perspectives of Indian society. Professor Sarkar's lecture only, not only fits that objective, but will help us to develop it. This lecture is jointly organized with Göttingen's modern historians, and the Graduate School Dynamics of Space and Gender, who have joined the colloquia with us for this event. We are pleased that this has been possible and are certain that Professor Sarkar's lecture will result in a lively discussion. Thanks. It's a great privilege to be here, and I thank the several departments that gave me this opportunity to uh, share some of my thoughts on this subject with you. Uh, it's a longish paper, so I'll start right away. Uh, it's the broad theme of the paper is something that is that will be familiar to all of you. It's about the immolation of Hindu widows on the funeral pyre of their husbands. And I'll be talking about the early colonial administration of this ritual. And my presentation is divided into three parts. In the first, I will invoke some of the very influential uh, post-colonial and feminist frameworks within which the subject of sati has been discussed in recent times. In the second part, I'll touch on several aspects or I'll narrate certain sati events, let's call them, that illuminate uh, aspects of the colonial governance of the ritual. And finally, I'll refer to some of the public sphere debates in the early 19th century that eventually led to the abolition of Sati uh, in 1829. Uh, who were the widows who became Sati? In police reports that were annually sent up to the House of Commons from India from 1815 onwards, uh, we find that there was an average of 500 to 900 women who were immolated every year in the lower provinces of Bengal alone. And I will be focusing on Bengal because we have the fullest reports from Bengal. Uh, <clears throat> their age ranged between 4 and 100 years, the Sati's ages. And they came all, from all parts of the country, but we get fewer reports of sati or immolation from the eastern parts of Bengal. It prevailed, it seems, among all the castes. Uh, but the thickest cluster came from the Brahmins, the purest of the pure, and also at the other end of the pole from a cluster of uh, upwardly mobile but low in status, Shudra castes. So it seems, and I'll develop this later, immolation seemed to be a 
a route to upward mobility for a variety of lowly caste, quote unquote lowly caste. How did the um, immolation happen? According to sacred scripture, the would-be sati had to take, before the process could begin, she had to take a ritual pledge called sankal before she ascends the pyre. And that was an invariant part of the whole procedure. In words that are solemn and also rather beautiful, she calls upon the sun, moon, stars, all the elements of the universe and all the gods in heaven to stand forth as witnesses to her momentous act. As she burns to death, the scriptures say, the scriptures say she enters heaven with her husband for as many years as there are hairs on her body or for a minimum of three million years. And she also washes away sins of seven generations of ancestors if she performs this act. In a traditional Bengali mode of reference, the sati is called Agun Khaki or fire eater. Note the woman who devours fire, not the woman who is devoured by fire. In both kinds of religious understanding then, classical and vernacular, the widow who commits sati is endowed with enormous ritual agency and activism. She is a savior figure. This constitutes a significant departure from the rest of the Hindu normative universe, where the good woman is always, must always be a prescribed person. As the great eponymous lawgiver Manu had said, Nastri Swatantra Marhati, the woman is never to be her own person. She must never be autonomous. <clears throat> Only by choosing to burn to death does she acquire self-definition, self-direction. Otherwise, the widow is a, an especially stigmatized and inauspicious being because her widowhood is attributed to her sinfulness in her past life. Contrast these very exalted descriptions with the words of the law that prohibited immolations in 1829, and I quote the exact words, Regulation 17 of the Bengal Code of 1829, a regulation declaring the practice of sati or the burning or burying alive of Hindu widows. This is not much known that some widows were also buried alive. Burning or burying alive of Hindu widows, illegal and punishable by criminal courts. How then do we read this contrast between the poetry of the verses and the legal prose? Post-colonial feminist scholars, notably Lata Mani and Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, argue that the colonial abolition denied her the agency that her faith had bestowed on her. In typical imperial fashion, the new law criminalized a sacred performance of colonized people whose culture was opaque to the alien rulers and to deracinated Indian reformers. In the very memorable words of Gayatri Chakrabarti Spiva, it's a case of white men saving brown women from brown men. Their kind of reading shifts our focus quite conveniently, I feel, from burning uh, female bodies to the epistemic violence of the West. It transmutes what could have been Indian cultural shame into Western colonial guilt. There are, of course, other feminist readings that are more critical of the ritual. Some, like Sangari and Ved, describe the widow's consent to burning as a product of ideological interpolation, as produced or made will, and therefore counterfeit inauthentic. A perfectly valid point, I feel, but the problem is that, that, made, that this makes the resistant woman's will, that is, the widow who refuses to burn, as something natural and ingrained, not something which too needs to be made through a different political mediation. Rajeshwari Sundar Rajan <clears throat> underlines the sheer magnitude of the pain of burning alive and argues that since it is fundamentally non-anticipable to living widows before they burn to death, 
Their consent to burning is unreal, as it is given prior to the actual experience of burning to death. Again, a fine point, but the problem is this exclusive accent on pain makes emulations an existential and not a political problem. Unlike, unless some kinds of pain are translated as injustice, pain by itself does not lead to social change or to a new politics. Feminists look and feminists uh, face yet another area of discomfort in the practice and its abolition. There is no denying, of course, that sati, the ritual injunction was a patriarchal prescription and a prescription of great violence. But on the one hand, those who agitated for its abolition were all men and men of the wrong kinds, it seems. Bourgeois liberal reformers, Western colonial officials, European missionaries, and one knows that no good comes from such men. Whereas, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Whereas the widows, who would have provided the right kind of agency for change, are completely silent throughout the debates, their voice is simply not heard. So how does one read that? And therefore, again, Mani and Spivak would say that this is a suppression of the woman's voice. Abolition was a suppression of the woman's voice. I would accentuate the discomfort to underline a very obvious fact, that is the sheer anachronism of expecting an autonomous women's politics, even as a latency in all historical circumstances, as something always already there. So if you do not hear the voice, you assume the voice is saying something very different, but the voice must always be there not something that requires certain historical conditions for its emergence. So this split between the right action and the right agency, I think, is a productive difficulty. And the dislocation between the two suggests that we need, perhaps, a more ironic stance towards the entire question of voice or agency. Now, what I find important and interesting in the history of colonial emulations is that in stark contrast to every other European settlement in India, Danish, Dutch, uh, Portuguese, French, where emulations were strictly forbidden from the outset, from the very foundation of the settlements, British India to, took more than 60 years to outlaw this ritual. So the astonishing fact is not that it was abolished, but the astonishing fact is that for well over a fourth of its total lifespan, the colonial state allowed full legality to the ritual. The prolonged immunity and legality required a systematic governance. The dimension of governmentality, techniques of knowing and managing subject bodies, required in turn a new kind of relationship between the state and its subjects. So in the interest of currently administering the ritual, the colonial state expended quite an incredible amount of time and energy to figure out exactly which women should burn and exactly how they should burn. The state patiently sought to recover the figure of the quote-unquote true self, both the widow who scripturally authorized to burn and the process of burning as it is described in the various sacred sources. The state certainly did not invent the category of self, but it made it a social object, a pivot of discussion and investigation, the focus of a large number of administrative instruments. The state asked Hindu pundits, Brahman pundits, to define who is a true sati according to scripture. And in everything that it did subsequently, it would never diverge even an inch from the advice that the Brahman pundits gave the state. So the state never acted on its own. The pundits consulted sacred scripture and eventually advised the government that the widows own consent to burning was a cardinal requirement. 
The fact that they took some time to find this out shows that her consent was not something that had always or necessarily played a role in actual practice. The machinery of the modern bureaucratic state now made the scriptural condition a matter of elaborate administrative procedure. Carefully investigated and systematically documented by state agencies, it gave her consent a public emphasis and an importance that did not exist earlier. Classificatory categories developed to distinguish true consent from coercion, licit second from unauthorized ones. The meaning of consent, moreover, slowly changed over the entire century. <clears throat> Female consent was previously a ritual necessity for emulations. Slowly, fitfully, it began to morph into an idea that was freestanding, a desirable, if not an actual, moral foundation for lawmaking as well as for ritual performance. Something else happened in the process. In the belief that it was implementing scripture, state attention focused on the solitary figure of the widow. Prized away from her guardians, it made sure that consent belonged to her absolutely, that it was not shaped by family influence or pressure. At the very public site of the cremation ground, in front of vast crowds of spectators, the police, the magistrates, and the collectors ascertained from her if she actually wanted to die. The procedure set up a division between the family's words and hers. It took her out of her embedded status and made her stand forth notionally as a separate agent speaking for herself. It also created a nebulous potential for an oppositional female self, a widow who might, at the last moment, refuse to burn. Sometimes women did step into that place. From such dark conjugations, a notion of female autonomy and individualism began to emerge, and I have a larger argument that faultingly, tentative, falteringly, tentatively, it eventuated in a concept of legal right. It soon transpired, however, that consent was not an easy matter to define. Was it a one-time decision embedded in the sankat after which it became written in stone, or did it have to last as long as there was life in her? Was it like the Brahmanical marriage sacrament unconditionally indissoluble? Or was there a possibility of retraction even after the pronouncement of the cycle? Such uncertainties about her consent matched deeper ambiguities about the identity of the self. When does the woman actually become self? When does the widow transmute into the self? After she had taken the pledge or after she had burned to death? Is she a self? <coughs> ever a material living presence, or is she a spectral being actualized by death alone? Folk practices around immolations expressed yet another kind of ambiguity. It was a custom that crowds of spectators gathered around <clears throat> the pyre and collected bits of burnt wood from the funeral pyre. These were used for healing as well as for evil doing against enemies. For the widow, pledged to perform sati could turn either divine or malevolent, depending on her moral fiber. If she went through death with resolution, she became a holy figure. On the other hand, she could equally change into a folk devil, who could and who often did try to escape from the pyre, first having sworn the pledge, and thereby plunge her lineage into everlasting shame. Her mortal body was therefore a theater of contrary possibilities, and so was her consent. I now come to the history of the colonial governments. As soon as the East India Company assumed administrative power in Bengal <coughs> in 1770, the new colonial state promised Indian self-governance in their personal beliefs and relationships. In all matters related to marriage, divorce, faith, ritual, caste, inheritance, succession, dower, and adoption, Indian communities were left free to follow their own religious texts and customs. And the state said it would intervene only if 
present practice was shown to be inauthentic and a violation of ancient scripture or time-honored custom. Sati, therefore, was part of a protected species. <clears throat> the long legal life of emulations in colonial India, I think, encompassed four distinct phases, and I'll do later a very quick walk through them. Through them. The first lasted till 1805 when they were unreservedly allowed. From 1805, bureaucrats began to consult pundits about their exact status and form. Between 1812 and 1817, a slew of circulars appeared cautioning the police, magistrates, and judges about non-permissible sects. These did not have the force of laws or regulations as they were then called, but were rather advisories. They were frequently violated, not, le not least by European judges, magistrates, and the police. A category of licit immolations nonetheless took shape, and Sati finally entered the realm of colonial governors. The final phase commenced from 1818. A group of orthodox intellectuals petitioned the government to withdraw all restrictions on the ritual. Ram Mohan Roy, the great uh, early reformer, wrote two successive tracts opposing their arguments. His words proved the existence of, quote unquote, an enlightened Hindu opinion, in Bentinck's words, without whose approval no governor general could have taken the final step. What the countless hideous burnings of widows, some of them mere children desperately trying to escape, had not achieved. And what the Christian conscious, quote unquote, of missionaries and officials had failed to reverse was finally accomplished when a Brahman, that is Ram Mohan Roy, provided a persuasive scriptural justification. To the state, then, the value of Ram Mohan lay not in his status as a liberal and a modern, which he certainly was, but in being a Brahman whose scriptural knowledge was legendary. How did then the ritual enter governments? The first step in this direction occurred in 1789 when H. Brew, collector of Shahabad, informed Governor General Cornwallis that he had stopped an immolation on his own. He thought that since, I quote, the horrid ceremony was forbidden in the European dominated precincts of Calcutta, it might be the same anywhere, everywhere in Bengal. He just did not know if there was a colonial legal framework for such. Worried that, I quote, I had no specific orders for the guidance of my conduct, unquote, he sought reassurance that he had done the right thing. Cornwallis' reply was uh, significant. Brooke should try and dissuade the family, but, I quote, the government did not deem it advisable to authorize him to prevent the observance by co uh, coercive measures or by any exertion of his official powers, unquote. An interesting case came up in 1797. The magistrate of Midnapur, James Battery, wrote to the then Governor General Shore, and I quote, a child by name Kumli intended sacrificing herself with her husband. She being scarcely nine years of age, unquote, he felt himself duty bound to prevent it. Now this is interesting because this was the first time that immolations were questioned on grounds of age and consent. The letter skillfully counterposes the two motives, Kumli's intention to burn and her being scarcely nine. Infancy seemed to cancel out consent or at least to put it under a question mark. Shaw echoed Cornwallis, Battery might use his powers of persuasion but he should do nothing more. In order to establish the status of the ritual, the Asiatic Society Journal published a long article the same year by the celebrated Orientalist scholar H.T. Colby. And he cited an impressive array of scripture from the Vedas to various Smritis and Puranas to prove that unlike many other customary suicides or killings like food that Radhika Singha has worked on, Immolations were definitely scripturally sanctioned and valid. In 1812, the fifth report of the Select Committee on Indian Matters made the status of immolations clear, and I quote, 
the government had deemed it expedient to take measures for putting a stop to the barbarous practice of certain Hindus, not sanctioned by their Shastra, that is scripture. But in regard to immolation, no further interference is permitted to take place. So that seemed to be that. Complications nonetheless ensued when the problem of coercion confronted officials. In 1805, the Daruka, the senior police official of Gaya, reported the imminent immolation of a 12-year-old widow in his jurisdiction. Remarkably, her friends secretly informed the Daruka that her in-laws were forcing her hands and she herself was unwilling. When the Daruga went to the site, he found her, I quote, in a perfect state of stupefaction or intoxication. So the magistrate prevented this immolation and reported, I quote, the girl and her friends are extremely grateful for my interposition, and he then asked for further instructions. And the government now was obliged to take matters more seriously. If Kubli's infancy had put her in a dubious and uncomfortable category, this was an explicit case of coercion. At least, it made it imperative to know more about who could and who could not become a sati, rather than allow, without sufficient information, full license to families to burn their unwilling girls. Pandits were consulted for the first time and they issued their verdict in 1805. They specified the four main varnas, Brahmans, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras, who were entitled to immolation. They also said that widows must not be pregnant, nor be with infant children, nor in a state of uncleanness, as they put it, nor under the age of puberty. For a long time, puberty was uh, mentioned, but no exact age count was given. Much later, around 1817, it was stipulated that she had to be above 16 years of age. No force nor intoxication must be used and the woman should be entirely willing. Then a new phase unfolded as the government began to act on the specified conditions and terms. At the same time, since the new rules were embodied in circulars rather than in regulations which stood in for proper laws, they did not have the status of full scale laws. Mm -hmm. And quite often, blatant breaches of rules were not punished at court, nor did magistrates always follow them. Nor were penalties spelled out in the circulars for disobedience. Moreover, given that thanas were so few and far between, that is one for every 400 square miles when Cornwallis first set them up, most cases would escape the notice of state official. Let me now explore a few cases where some significant problems cropped. The widow's age was the first important ground for immolation. Female age, however, was a notoriously slippery substance. No mechanism for registration of births would develop till the late 1880s, so family memory had to be tapped into to ensure that she was genuinely of age. But how many families would accurately remember the birth of girls since that was quite a long event? More than her actual age, the state at this point, as I just said, insisted on whether she had reached puberty or not. But puberty could hardly be checked by an outside agency. Family memory, however, moreover, was often strategic. The question of ascertaining her age came up only after the family had already taken the decision to immolate her, expecting and remember that this was taken very seriously, believed in very sincerely, expecting to harvest enormous ritual benefits from her death. That, uh, you know, her paternal, maternal and matrimonial lineages would be freed from sin up to the you know, seventh generation <coughs> ancestors. Uh, <clears throat> um, also, if her infancy was at least notionally a protected domain, old age was not. Police reports show up a very large number of extremely old widows, some in their 90s or even in their hundreds. 
Of course, their actual age was not known, and their reported age was based on signs of extremely advanced senility. This would also make the notion of consent meaningless. Even childhood of modern India, childhood was not such a protected domain after all. Circulars notwithstanding, the police clearly are sometimes allowed, as is evident from their own reports, eight, nine, or even four-year-olds to burn without interference or even comments. The question of consent was doubly compounded in one case that Reverend Bob uh, cited. An eight-year-old girl was playing out far too late and her aunt scolded her. Offended, the little girl threatened to become a serpent. This was understood as a sworn sunk by her family, and when her husband died, her quote-unquote wish was duly carried out. Let me take up the question of age on another register, the age of the orphan that the Sati would leave behind. Earlier verdicts had forbidden immolations where widows left behind infants. But who was an infant? When does a human being reach infancy, reach the state of infancy, and when does he or she stop being an infant? This came to some sort of definition in 1813 when the magistrate of Burdwan wrote about a sati who had left behind a two and a half year old child. And he then consulted his own pandit. Every magistrate seemed to possess you know, his, his own pandit. And the pandit pulled out some Shastric citations to prove that uh, an infant is a person up to three years of age and that up to this age, uh, if the orphan was uh, below three and the orphan had no one, to look, uh, no one else to look after her, then no immolation could take place. A very strange verdict because as if a Someone who is more than three, year, uh, three years of age can bring herself up, but nonetheless, this was the minimum condition. Uh, so he said that because the infant had been in this case below three, uh, he had arrested ten members of that family. Now, as a result of his pains, he was soundly rebuked by the Governor General, who said that you were, go you were going beyond your, uh, you know, your rights and you must never do it again. And he wrote back in anger, great anger, saying that I have stopped so many immolations so far on this ground of the age of the orphans. Your own circulars tell us to observe this. So what is this? If that is so, why issue a circular? The question of infancy was particularly disturbing to many officials. <clears throat> And it would remain a contentious legal arena till the end of the century, controversies flaring up on a different register over the age of consent and in the first factory act. It was as if age was a tackle that the state threw out to reel in children as subjects of colonial law. When they crossed the legally prescribed stage of childhood, they would be subject to the laws of their community or of their capitalist employers. But before that, the state underwrote certain absolute entitlements and immunities. Within the frame of legal debates over age, of satis and their orphans, of child wives and the child worker, a domain of childhood came to be defined for the first time, carrying with it a range of legal rights. It also acquired considerable emotional force and appeal. I will now quickly go through a few rather strange kinds of immolations which tell us something about how the category was generally perceived before the regulations entered the scene. It also tells us something about the way many colonial officials chose to respect popular sentiments even when they strained against the letter of scripture and their own circulars. Let us just Rem uh, remember the basic preconditions for self. The first precondition was that there should be a husband, the husband should be dead, and there should be a dead body. The sati must climb into the pyre along with the, she must burn with the body of a dead, a dead husband. There was a case where a wife dreamt that she had been visited by her husband's spirit. Convinced that he was dead, she insisted on immolation even though no news of death had actually come. 
Her family allowed her to burn without informing the police, so there was a double infringement of law. Pundits admitted, when consulted, they admitted that such an immolation was entirely non-shastric, non-scriptural. At the same time, says the wife's action in the case expressed, quote-unquote, an excess of chastity. Her decision should be honored. The European judge C. Smith agreed and let off the family members. Another obvious condition was that the ritual belonged to Hindus alone. It was a Hindu ritual. In 1819, the Gorakhpur court tried a case where a Muslim fakir had successfully urged his nephew's widow to burn herself, along with her husband. It somehow seemed a difficult matter to settle. Two Muslim law officers of the Nizam of Adalat finally issued a fatwa which decreed the fakir to six months of imprisonment because the woman had been asked to burn herself, not to be buried. The ritual, moreover, belonged to the wife alone. Only the widow, the legitimate wife, had the, was entitled to be a second. In 1822, the Gorakhpur court again judged a case where the father had allowed his daughter to burn with her, with his son. That is, the sister committing sati with the brother. He pleaded that the daughter had insisted on it. I found at least three cases where concubines, doubly prohibited for being immoral and non-wife, were allowed to burn. Immolation meant death only by burning. Jubilees, as a caste, buried their dead, and several of their widows were buried alive, following a distinctive ritual sequence all of their own, which is not to be found in any scripture. This came under a question mark in 1813, and the pundits categorically stated that the custom contravened the scriptural form of sati. A sati must burn. Jugis were also considered a most inferior and mixed caste, too polluted to be entitled to the right. In 1817, however, pundits of the Sadar Diwani Adalat waived the objection even while recognizing its force. The intention to die with the husband, they said, proved such exemplary chastity that these widows must be rewarded by the entire And this story has an interesting sequel. In the early 20th century, we find the same caste asking the census of authorities to, uh, uh, to enumerate them as a subdivision of Brahmins. And we find the same story with regard to yet another impure, untouchable caste which was not supposed to perform the violations, that is the Chandalas. Once again in the early 20th or late 19th century, the same Chandalas who had been permitted to burn their widows were also asking for a higher ritual status in the census. So it seemed that <clears throat> Immolation was a route to upward ritual mobility. And the widow, by courting death, did great service not only to her several lineages but also to the entire jata. Conversely, not just her family but the entire subcaste would have stakes in her death. In all these dubious cases, the practice spilled beyond the sanction, community, condition, relationship, and ritual form. Yet, in all these, yet all these inappropriate satis were burned in public with the full support of local opinion. Obviously, the crowds that stood around watching found nothing incongruous in these inappropriate satis. So it seems to me that traditionally, emulations might have signified a rather open and fuzzy domain. Court cases did try to peel away layers of inappropriateness to pare down the figure of the true sati to her essential prescribed characteristics. But in effect, public and priestly sanction continuously overran Shastric injunctions. Astonishingly, European judges often followed their lead. Now, in all cases of inappropriate immolations or burials, judges accepted departures from scripture on one dominant ground. If the woman's will to burn had been overpowering, it could be allowed to overrule prescriptions. Cases where brutal force had been clearly applied constituted the most problematic category. 
And here I'll briefly refer to the judgment in the Hunulia case, which was tried at the Gorakhpur Sessions Court, and then come up, came up to the Southern Nizam of Adalat, in eight, that is the highest criminal court, in 1828. Humulia was about 14, definitely underage, and was living with her natal family when her husband died. And the Adalat later decided to, I quote, presume it was so. Sorry, she supposedly had agreed to swear the pledge, though the police could not confirm it, and the Adalat, the criminal court, later decided to quote unquote, presume it was so, and gave no reasons for this presumption. As flames began to blaze, she leapt out. She was caught by her uncle and was thrown back into the pile, I quote, much burned and her clothes quite consumed. She again sprang from the pile and running to a wall hard by, laid herself down in the watercourse, weeping bitterly. Her uncle now took up a sheet and, spreading it on the ground, desired her to seat herself upon it. No, no, she said, she would not do this. She would quit her family and live by beggary." Unquote. Her uncle saw that she would be taken back home, so she came and sat, was bundled up, and was thrown back again into the fire. I quote, The wretched victim once more made an effort to save herself. This time, a Muslim standing by was urged by the proud to behead her with his sword, and her, as the sword touched her neck, the head fell back, and it was not quite clear whether she had died of burning or of the sword. The Sessions judge decided to treat it as murder. At the Southern Nizam of Adalat, second judge C. Smith disagreed violently. He would exempt the uncle from all blame since the girl had taken the pledge voluntarily. After that, no other option lay before the uncle since to let her escape would damage his lineage status irrevocably. He was, therefore, in Smith's words, an object of pity rather than of punishment. In this, as in so many of his other judgments, Smith chose to pronounce as many doubtful emulations lawful as he could, on the ground always that the widow had initially taken the pledge. Now, reading these cases, at first I had presumed that like many of his uh, uh, contemporaries, this judge too shared an admiration for the widow's courage and resolve. I was therefore considerably puzzled to find that just before this case, the same judge had written a very strong letter to the Governor General, urging for, I quote, an entire and immediate abolition of the horrid ritual. So what was going on here? Uh, uh, Prabhu Mahapatra's work, recent work, alerted me to a possible alternative line of argument. And I'm just speculating that this mysterious ambivalence of Judge C. Smith was perhaps anchored in a particular mode of legal reasoning, derived from English common law and law practiced by the Court of Chancery in Britain. Later, this would be applied very stringently in tea plantations against Indian coolies. This was the contractual law of specific performances, according to which if the laborer hired to perform a specific act of labor had signed the contract voluntarily at the point of his entry to the labor regime, then under no circumstances would he be let off from the contractual obligation until he had completed the specific performance. The family resemblance between the swearing of the oath and the capitalist contract law perhaps made the widow's self-pledged obligation so absolute in two British legal minds. The verdict, however, carried ironical implications. While Smith insists on the total sanctity of her contempt at the moment of the sunken, the pledge, a few others allow her the right to develop a different will after the pledge, that is, to rescind the pledge. It is her decision, however, that remains the cornerstone of all judgments. She must decide. Out of such deeply paradoxical stresses on her consent, a new status eventuates for the woman's will voice decision. The bureaucratized context of consent, moreover, endows the sati with a new kind of agential initiative. 
So far, she gathered enormous ritual agency by innovation. In the new colonial uh, regime, in contrast, the fate of the ritual itself would hang on her works. In every case, whether or not there was going to be a settlement would be decided by her. As some widows publicly asserted their will to burn, overruling the pleas of magistrates, they now appeared to Bengali Hindus as saviors of their faith. In late 19th century nationalist imagining, she became uh, the savior of the Hindu nation itself. In her courage and commitment lay the signs of past greatness and the seeds of future nationhood, wrote Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay, a great novelist in the 1870s. A very young Rabindranath Tagore com composed a rather horrible song uh, about the blazing beauty of the widow burning widows in the same decade. The transition from liberal reformism to Hindu revivalism and cultural nationalism in Bengal began precisely in this decade and quite a lot had to, uh, of it had to do with the revalorization of the memory of service. The orthodoxy now uh, began to defend the ritual, not as a holy or ancient rite, but more as an expression, as they put it, her, of her own will and pleasure. Reformers, on the other hand, strain hard to prove that consent was meaningless based on misinformation and vulnerability. In the process, female consent became a word that everybody needed to claim and possess. As Paul Rickle makes the point, the very word denotes a degree of helplessness. I consent to something that is not of my own making. But when the consent of the subaltern needs to be solicited and displayed conspicuously by dominant groups and can no longer be assumed, taken for granted, a new historical situation is born and a crucial shift in the practice of hegemony has taken place. Very quickly, I now come to the public debates and sum it up in a moment of, or two. It would be very interesting to see, if only we had the time, the development of modern exegetical methods from the mutual exchanges between Kashinath Tarkobanish, the leading orthodox spokesman arguing in behalf of emulations, and Ram Mohan Roy, who of course uh, tried to get it abolished. Ram Mohan, the master polemicist, certainly presented rather strange and overstretched Shastric readings, scriptural readings. I would say even somewhat dishonest readings of scripture in his despair. He was playing with very poor cards. His initial arguments hinged on who could count as the most venerable sacred authority. And if some of these scriptural sources had been silent, had kept silent about immolation, he interpreted this as their disapproval of the practice. More important is what Ram Mohan inserts insidiously into the arguments that are only ostensibly about the ritual. A notion of a superior female morality and resolution and a strong argument for educating women. Women were not actually allowed to be even literate at that point of time. He said that, oh, sorry, Kashinath objected saying that women were intellectually incompetent to receive any kind of knowledge. Ram Mohan asked, I quote, when did you test their intelligence that you call them foolish? In the second half of his second tract, Ram Mohan suddenly transits to a very different discursive terrain. He gives up textual arguments altogether, and with great compassion, passion, anger, and shame, he starts to describe what Hindu men had done to Hindu women over the ages, developing in the process an altogether new male case and a new literary genre to describe the woman. The woman is no longer the nubile, beautiful body exalted in Sanskrit literature in so many different ways. In his discourse, they are Theirs are abused and savage bodies, a site of exploitation. He was not the first Indian to criticize them. There are a few voices even earlier, the Emperor Akbar, the ancient commentator Medhaditi, and so on. But he was the first to write in, in this kind of a vein about the lives of people more than their deaths. 
uh, he talks in very concrete, material, elaborate detail about her everyday labor, her imprisonment in the small kitchen where she spends days and nights to feed the family while dining on scanty leftover herself, all the penalties for all suspected and real misconduct, the sexual double standards within the family, the special torments of poor low caste women. The abandonment of the field of sati is significant. It seems that immolations were really a purpose to his more serious, uh, were a preface to a more serious purpose to talk about the life of Hindu women and its possible redefinition. The woman, no longer just the widow or the sati, springs from his writings fully fashioned as victims of male tyranny. But they are not just abject creatures, for they are also bestowed by his writings with moral strength, intelligence and skills. In a later tract, he argued eloquently for the widow's property rights. These moral and emotional, emotional compulsions, however, would have cut no ice with the legal judicial framework of the state. What eventually made his argument foolproof to colonial minds was his very intelligent reclassification of the ritual as an entirely customary one. In all sacred texts that valorize immolations, he says, and here indeed he is on firm ground, the woman walks free into fire. But as it is practiced, the widow is first tied to the husband's body, then is secured to the pyre with stout ropes. Loads of jute bales and logs are then heaped on her. She is then held down with massive bamboo poles and set on fire. And as long as the cremation goes on, she is pressed down with the poles. This is not the scriptural ritual form of sati, he says. This is, as he calls it, woman murder both sinful and criminal. He dwelt again and again on the graphic de details of the funeral. He never used words like anumarana, sahamarana, uh, confirmation, post-cremation. He always referred to the rite as burning alive of the Hindu widow or plain and simple woman murder. The rhetoric was as carefully fashioned as were his scriptural and moral arguments. Kashinath did not rise to the challenge by saying that the mode of burning would now be altered and made scriptural, made, um, uh, would follow the scriptural form. He did not say that henceforth women would walk into the fire unbound. He feebly said that custom, it was customary, but custom should be regarded as equally sanctified as texts, and he gave a reason why the widow needed to be so secured. She would go to heaven for many millions of years, he said, and unless she was well trussed up, her limbs might drop off during the burning. And what was the point of going to heaven for ages without certain vital limbs? Such urgent reason not, notwithstanding, he did have to admit that the existing ritual form was indeed customary and non or anti-scripture. And this hopelessly undermined the rationale for emulations in colonial eyes, reducing satis to the status of a non-protected species of quote-unquote mere superstition. So at last the colonial state decided to abolish the right. It had a brief afterlife when the, new penal, the, when the penal code was under discussion, but I can come to that when, if it's raised in a discussion. So I'll end up with this uh, uh, comment that discussions of her entitlement to life were indeed halted and compromised, and law could not shake itself free of the binds of social morality. As Hart points out, the two often have a deeply symbiotic relationship. Uh, <clears throat> Ramohan, in fact, made uh, the task of a later generation of reformers very difficult because in order to save widows from burning, he kept on saying that they would remain very moral and uh, if they practiced ascetic widowhood and not, uh, not sati. And that made the next generation of reformers who were trying to uh, legalize widow remarriage rather problematic. So there were, it was not a, you know, a greatly forward, uh, unconditional, but 
it was somewhat compromised. Yet modern laws are made within a public sphere in the middle of urgent arguments about both state and scripture. It is incapable of, uh, they are incapable of providing secure, unquestioned norms. They interrogate all kinds of norms. What is enduring then is not so much, of, uh, much the letter of the law or its actual remit or effectivity. Far more significant are the disturbances and dissonances that the discussions set up within a cognitive and a moral universe hitherto ruled by social and sacred injunctions. In these small slits and folds, dislocations and slippages <coughs> occur, and slivers of counter norms make their tentative appearance. At the very least, doubts are articulated about both, about both law and scripture. In the process of Sati debates too, important new words have been uttered to express radically transgressive desires. Words about the Hindu woman's present condition and about her potentialities. These, like a specter, would come to haunt the normative world of Hindus for the rest of the century. Like quite a few cases like this. I mean, I just want to know the time frame. So when is C-slip 
uh, he is of uh, he is most of his cases that I have referred to are between 1819 and 1822. So around that time, I, I was just wondering, Humuria is at that time. Humuria is 22. And Ram Mohan, yes, Ram Mohan is in a desperate situation because the colonial state would not listen to a non-scriptural form of argument. So he throws it as a challenge that, you know, if you can, then let the women go free. Knowing my good was not such a thing, perhaps that it was not a challenge that was going to be taken up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Professor Shraka, for your very interesting talk. Uh, you referred to um, uh, videos being buried. Um, uh, this is something I'm, uh, I was not aware of. So, um, do you know under what circumstances of you would be buried? And also, we of course know that there were other social economic reasons for video burning. And have you, during your course of research, found any other? Um, Say specific reason in the case uh, of one particular video of my videos, I don't know. And also, um, as you referred to, the recent literature you know, on Ramamohan and Sati. Ramamohan mm -hmm. is often uh, presented as the compiler of the Ramamohan videos. I would like to know what you think about it. <laughs> okay, uh, the first was about uh, the Jupiter, the, the Devil. The burial, yes, uh, that related to the Jupi caste who traditionally uh, buried their dead and did not cremate their dead. So in their case, a particular ritual form was adopted wherein a deep hole was dug and the man and the wife were stood up together, bound together, and instead of setting fire as, you know, before the cremation process starts, Mukhagi, what was done was the son would come and stop the mother's noses and you know, orifices with mud, and then the hole would be closed. So this was not something that was ever mentioned in any scripture, but because they buried their dead, they took it over. So this was one. The second was other the, the socio-economic determinations, and actually from about 1819 to or early 20s to 28, we get very full documentation about uh, individual sati cases. We get details. They are like mini censuses, you know. We get details about their uh, husbands, caste, uh, uh, you know, age. Uh, circumstances, profession, all his earthly belongings, his property holdings, everything. And if we go through the list carefully, we find that they come from every different, uh, every possible kind of class and caste. So ritual mobility could be one reason, but then again, you know, the largest cluster comes from Brahmins, and you can't climb, uh, you know, above the Brahmin category at all. And uh, there were rich uh, families which immolated their widows, there were beggars who also immolated their widows, so I suppose there would be individual circumstances that uh, would uh, decide each case. Uh, there has been an argument that uh, after the Bengal famine of 1770 and the uncertainties around the new colonial revenue settlements, the big landholding families wanted to get rid of the widows because under the Bengal religious school of law, widows had a little bit of a, a usufruct entitlement to their husband's share of the family property. But we do get many widows who came from families without any property. So the overriding um, uh, factor here would be a genuine belief that Sati brings enormous ritual benefits to herself the husband of family, I would say. And uh, uh, as for Ram Mohan being a comprador, yes, he was. He was also a reformer. <laughs> he was. Uh, uh, maybe his uh, comprador role, uh, I think by now, fortunately, these words have gone a bit out of fashion comprador and national bourgeoisie <laughs> and so on. But uh, I think his uh, role as a comprador did bring him closely in touch with. Uh, some uh, European discomforts, 
with uh, suicide, but he was much better read in Islamic texts, so that could have been another reason factor behind it. Um, yeah, I'm very um, interested in the uh, interactions between the colonial state and the pundits. And um, what I'm very curious about, and I think that stems from a comment that you made about everybody had his own pundit. Uh, is that true? Did they have only one pundit? Have you come across instances of various, you know, on any one instance, uh, various pundits giving their, you know, uh, 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 where there's divergence of opinion? and the state then taking the more, adopting the more Shastric uh, interpretation <coughs> in the cases of such. Uh, more often than not, the cases would not come up to the highest authorities, the Southern Nizamat Adalat. The magistrate would make his on the ground decision. And yes, uh, first of all, the courts appointed pundits and murderers to help them advise on ritual matters up to 1864. But each magistrate, it seems to me, from a variety of cases that I have studied, uh, that they, each magistrate had his own pet pundit and not. This was one case, another case I have cited in this book, uh, where uh, uh, there was a very highly controversial case involving a widow, underage widow, who was actually walking around three districts trying to immolate herself and each magistrate would throw her out of his jurisdiction saying that you are under it according to my family. And eventually one of them allowed her to burn and he in self-defense later said that my family had been. So it seems that at least a large number of them would patronize families. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering whether we could not also frame the, the um, um, Rajamon Roy's intervention as translating ritual agency for people who don't understand ritual agency and only understand kinship agency. Kinship agency? Yeah, in the sense that what he was doing and what a lot of the literature that later on does, which you presented as recasting women as actual bodies, as actual victims, as you know, those who grew up work in the house and are incarcerated in the kitchen and so on, you know, um, translating from the, the women as they are depicted in the scriptures into something actually the, the, the administrators could understand, and that is kinship and property. Mm. I would agree with this, uh, definitely, but, you know, Ramon wrote both in Bengali and in English. And the abstract that he uh, wrote in English on Sati, which was meant for an English, uh, for a British readership, actually, and that actually used only scriptural arguments. So he was reassuring the British state in England that the Indian state, Indian colonial state was within scripture by abolishing Sati, in abolishing Sati. But when he writes for his Bengali readers, he is using more of these familiar instances and trying to defamiliarize them. And this familiarity is a very important thing to him. He says that we Hindus are not by nature cruel. We are in fact more merciful than many other people. Why is it then that we allow this to happen without any qualms? And he says that if we have, you know, we are over familiar with something, we do not pause to think about it. So I think these little details of their everyday lives, which people see as something natural and given, he was trying to uh, get that denaturalized. Uh, yeah, well, first off, uh, thank you for your very insightful and inspiring presentation. I would like, uh, my question goes into the same direction as the one uh, to Professor Lodge related to the pundits employed by the British state. Um, I would like to know in whether and yes, how far did this uh, appropriation of human law by the British state in the uh, late 18th century, which at the same time is probably also like a standardization and originalization of the Spiritualized law. Um, how far did that contribute uh, towards the spread of practices or to the standardization of practices which I would imagine were not like uh, you know, generally prevalent throughout all the, all the countryside, but now that they have become like, recognized law by 
I stay with the help of these other task candidates, calling that by calling that change the actual practice of exactly in the example. So like the other any instances or is it imaginable that the practice the practice of SATI did spread to areas where it was had not really been known or practiced before? That's a difficult question to answer because before the British came, and in fact before 1815, when they started sending annual compiling annual police reports to be sent to Parliament, House of Commons, uh, they, we do not have certain statistics. So we do not know where it was prevalent, where it, you know, no statistics were kept. And even these are very imperfect statistics. So whether they are spreading or more reports are now being made available to the police and the police force itself is spreading out. It's very difficult to... Now I know what you are getting at and there is a view that the British by trying to codify earlier according to the pundits uh, uh, you know, advice and later on through you know, codified laws and so on, they are actually freezing what used to be fluid and multifarious. But if we uh, take a long-term view and also a close view, we find, as the Sati uh, records, I think, show us, we find actually they are desperately trying to freeze, but they are desperately unable to do so. So there is this tension all the time between intention and actual performance. So it's an extremely fluid and chaotic situation. And their laws, they're making and are making laws, putting in clauses, making amendments and so on. They are never, ever at a point where they are on, on top of a situation, have stabilized it firmly and have put it in that's, under that. This is my sort of understanding. They are trying to do that, no doubt, but it doesn't happen. It does happen with Sati though. I mean, there are not too many references to Sati after this law uh, is, is passed. And this is a new law and this definitely freezes the non-burning of windows, with some e exceptions here and there. But otherwise, on the whole, they cannot cope with the multifariousness adequately. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the Chandalas or a Chandala mm -hmm. you know, going for a Sati. Hmm. What was the reaction of the social reformers towards to that particular uh, sati, you know, the extent? Were they literally worried about the sati as a practice? Or what was that, you know, I mean, the other day, how did they react towards to that particular, you know, sati? This was actually, I think, in 1813, when there were Chandala widows who were being burned. But there was a case that came up to the court and uh, uh, the court then took a decision whether or not, had to take a decision formally whether or not to allow this and eventually it allowed. I mean it said that Chandalas can after consulting pundits. At that stage Ram Mohan had not yet started writing and the reformist, uh, reformist discourse was not in place. But had there been a reformist uh, agitation, I would think they would not differentiate among castes. And they would want all, all kinds of emulations to disappear and not. I mean, they were not using the argument, or Ram Mohan did not use the argument, that certain kinds of inappropriate satis were happening. Cars that didn't have the entitlement were also performing the satir, performing emulation. That's not an argument that he used. Yes. Actually, I want to know about, uh, like you were saying, uh, that colonial state has consolidated and supported to the Hindu tradition and the Sati system and everything. But the other hand, you can see Raja Ram Mumbai and such reformers, they are taking references from the Hindu text where we can call uh, Hindu culture or the dominant culture. Don't you think that this side of Swiss was somewhere supporting and consolidating Hindu culture in modern form? Like somewhere they were trying to protect uh, all the religious texts and through that they are maintaining the uh, Hindu tradition or the Hindu culture. Yes, this is an argument that Mani also uses that Sati was simply, a gender was simply an excuse, a site for reconstructing tradition and religion. 
Uh, and they, uh, I do not think that Ramun wanted to include Hinduism as faith or as a body of practices altogether. But uh, uh, there are two things. One is he had no option. If he wanted an abolition, he had to use scriptural arguments because the state would not listen to any other kind of argument. Okay, it's no use saying that Brahmins are rotten people and this is a rotten practice because this is not going to make any difference to the state. So he has to find, and this was something that actually bound the reformers into a very serious trade chapter. But if we look at the tenor of Ram Mohan's other writing, especially in the second tract, when he absolutely lets go of sati and of scriptural arguments, and he talks of women in Hindu society, we find that the language is so powerful, so emotional, and so secular in that sense, you know, without any reference to religion. The just invoking norms of natural social justice, that we think that scriptural arguments were strategic and were not his real intention. I think you'll be careful to read through that. But to be practical, to effectively do away with Sati, there was no other argument that he could have used even if he had wanted to. Because the state would not entertain any other kind of argument. So he might have sort of been a, made a very radical statement condemning Brahmanism and Brahmanical gender practices. But that would not have made any difference to emulations. Actually, when I was reading about the Pune, like Pune is taking references from the Vajra Suchi. Ashwa Vajra is writing and he's criticizing the caste system and the women's problem, widowhood, childhood, everything. Pune is taking references mm -hmm. from the anti-caste tradition. You see, really but that Pule is not trying to push through a particular law, abolishing a particular. He is making a very broad social critique. Okay? If he wants to abolish Sati, if he wants to legalize widow remarriage, he would have to, under colonial conditions, use scriptural citations to show. Otherwise, that particular law does not go through. You see the problem that faces these people. Ramon, by the way, actually translated the Raja Suchi into Shindigali. So it's not that he was unaware of uh, non-Brahmanical um, you know, traditions of, or critiques of Brahmanical culture, or what we loosely call Brahmanical culture. He was very aware of that. He also, you know, uh, was extremely beholden um, <coughs> to Islamic sources on this. Um, I'm, I'm still wondering um, about the, the British side, I mean, the, the, the state. Uh, um, and um, I'm, I'm really um, was very astonished to, to hear that they I mean, the judges themselves have religious background. Uh, and I mean, uh, there are missionaries in India at that time. I mean, there must be very controversial discussions about what is going on there. They, they don't have any influence on how they react in their... The missionaries? No, no, not the missionaries, but the, that is the, the perspective that the missionaries will bring in in this discussion, I'm sure, um, must have had any, some influence on you know, what's going on in the sports, or don't they? Mm -hmm. uh, what the officials were saying, and they were saying uh, very many different things, and there was a very, very active debate among the officials, judges, magistrates, senior European police officials, particularly one called Walter Muir, who actually scoured the uh, religious uh, texts and tried to bring up uh, you know, arguments very similar to what Ramon would use later. But his words didn't carry any weight because he was not a Brahman. So there was a very active debate, but that was restricted within official circles, and that did not enter the public sphere. The public sphere, which was just nascent, was just emerging, and uh, one of my arguments is that it was emerging through and with the seven debates, because scores of newspapers were started to discuss this, and uh, texts were translated, and uh, you know, commentaries were written in vernaculars, and so on at this point of time. 
So there was a study still, a circus formed to look at and read the text and to see what was the right um, uh, prescription and injunction and so on. Uh, that was confined to uh, the missionaries who wrote in Bengali and who uh, actually started Bengali newspapers and started the Bengali press and various shows of orthodoxy and orthodox from about 1880 to 1890. Mm -hmm. And that uh, uh, developed at that time, but within a couple of years it was a full fledged debate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm not very knowledgeable in these things, but I have read in a book on um, saints and these saints in, in India that there were one or two very recent cases of widow burning um, again. And yeah. so I was wondering are these just sad single instances or is in the um, larger framework of um, right wing Hinduism in the very recent period? Uh, Again, a discussion on this subject in general. The more recent ones, this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, a few years ago. Oh, yes, yes. The more recent ones, um, Difficult to say, you know, the, they, they are few. They are not numerous. Uh, but uh, how, and I, I have to say that by and large, even the very fundamentalist and um, the Hindu right does not support them, at least not overtly. They have kept their distance from these things. But there may be links, hidden links, between some subgroups within the Hindu right and these uh, things. Now, uh, I'm not very clear whether they are, they are fated to remain restricted. Uh, because when these happened, you know, the Kanwar case in, when was it, 1987? with the case and so on, uh, the kind of belief structure that the photographs, the various kinds of uh, orthodox writings and so on uh, display shows a, a, a kind of uh, genuine belief and faith in the efficacy of this ritual as strong as it was in the early 19th century. But so far they have been very few and maybe strong. <coughs> Well, a very simplistic question, I answer. Uh, data and social recidivism, repeat offense, uh, is actually very difficult to read. In the Sorry, sense, recidivism, yes. uh, repeat offense and mm -hmm. repeat offenders and all that. It's very difficult to read these the policing. If policing goes, goes up, then you know, that reflects in the, the data records differently. So my question is, like I have always wondered, because I uh, read references to uh, to Satis and uh, how uh, proud to, to to invoke them and to uh, proudly claim that I my, my, uh, that kind of uh, lineage. And so, uh, how prevalent was that? In the sense that did it actually have an impact? The abolition of Sati. Okay. Uh, because you're saying like some three four hundred references every year. And whether the ones who were uh, legitimate uh, Satis, so there would be some illegitimate kind of ones. And actually, how many were like stopped in the room? Or were all these the um, uh, instances where uh, police or some state state intervened in some form? Um, the second uh, is also an observation because from your uh, things and from what I have read, uh, sati wasn't a, uh, who could be called sati, and the ritual of uh, uh, performing sati wasn't a standardized kind of a thing. You know? Starting with how whether to bind the woman with the pyre. Uh, what kind of uh, how do you born now? And like that description in itself was um, was was not uh, standard in that sense. So uh, so who constituted sati in that sense? As against the, the, there will be many instances where uh, people women would be uh, immolated without any uh, such uh, hello thing that you did to her then. So yeah, these two kind of things. Yeah, I mean. Uh not all the cases uh, of Sati entered into the police records. And one of the reasons why it seems to be somewhat rare in Eastern Bengal was it was a bit remote. Eastern and Northern Bengal, these were more remote areas. And we have the maximum clustering of Sati around Calcutta, the districts around Calcutta. 
And that could be one reason because the police force was well established there. So it would depend on that. Uh, second, the police also often allowed uh, illegitimate settings to take place. For instance, on their own records, we find cases of four year olds being burnt when there was already in place a kind of an age limit, uh, sorry, uh, an upper limit, uh, what is it, an upper limit, a lower limit that has been imposed. So the police allowed these to happen and there were discussions in official circles about whether to send Hindu policemen at all to, be, to verify these cases because they seem to, uh, you know, bend it, bend over backwards to allow these things to happen, as a, uh, illegitimate circles to go through. Uh, so whether policing actually stops uh, Sati or not is... Uh, doubtful and the number of satis was going up. That was one of also one of the reasons behind abolition that for a long time up to Amherst the hope was that uh, with education etc it would die down but it was actually growing, the incidents were actually growing in Amherst. Uh, after the abolition, after 29 which was the Bengal regulation and in 1830 almost identical regulations were passed for Bombay and Madras presidencies. Um, very few settings. The next one happens in 1840s. One. So it seems that it really actually terminated the practice effectively. Or, you know, once again it's a question of reporting. If they happened in a very obscure village, in a very obscure family, no one would want to tell the police about it. The police also would not want to know about it. These might have happened. But we can only go by the records. And the records do not show up. Yeah, but my, my question was slightly, you know, maybe I couldn't articulate the second part. Because when it is not standardized, so there could be different forms of death. People could be born differently. And there could be common criminal okay, okay, incidents. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, when you standardize something as a thing, uh, and of course, being a sati uh, gives you a lot of uh, you know, those things, your seven generations are clear of sin and those things. But uh, if it, uh, it that, that doesn't necessarily need to be there on the records. So when you, this is an extreme form of violence. And, and, and admittedly, three, four hundred cases every, every year. Um, in eight, nine hundred. Eight, nine, even eight, nine hundred. If you look at the crime records and then the demolition records, it is not too much in that sense. Because we still uh, do have those kind of records. And so, Sati was relatively rare. That is something I felt. You correct me if I'm not right. Absolutely. Most widows lived, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, by, by, by clearly uh, singling out Sati and um, abolishing it as one or two you know, token kind of things in that sense. Yeah. First of all, you know, there is a difference between one or two or uh, eight, nine hundred and something that's growing. No, no, I'm not saying that it's <laughs> So, what, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not very clear really, I'm sorry, what you are actually trying to say because are you saying that they should not have singled out Sati which affected a relatively small number of widows? No, more than that, demolition as a category could have been like punished. You cannot do that, like, you cannot demolate a, a living human being. Okay, now you could only... Why can you not do that? Sorry? Why can you not demolate a living human being? Meaning, if you are framing a law, mm -hmm. and you are taking, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, sastric, so to mm -hmm. say, references, mm -hmm. and then uh, legalizing or illegalizing a specific activity, but then we could uh, take a more general category and bring more such cases into the whole thing. So, I don't know. Cases like what? Like, you know, demolition as a source. Like witch hunting. For example. Witch hunting. Witch hunting or something that, uh, where, uh, that could be dealt with ordinary criminal law. Mm -hmm. Okay? But so far, up to 1829, mm -hmm. Before the generalization of the new criminal law and the courts and so on, Sati was protected because it had religious sanction behind it and scriptural sanction behind it. There were other kinds of religious suicides, like committing suicides under the sacred chariot wheels, or who that is, you know, that that does not work on. 
But the colonial state had a leeway there because these were not mentioned in scripture. Whereas Sati was not just mentioned but valorized. Okay? So those were also supposedly voluntary. But they could be abolished because they didn't have Shastric reference as citations. So the only category that would not come under our criminal law, because the Shastri, because it's a scriptural event, was immolation. Yeah, following up on the question on, uh, of uh, recent uh, cases of Sati in uh, Rajasthan, would you care to comment on how Perhaps. Rina Das and Ashish Nandi reacted to that? <laughs> uh, not really, I wouldn't, because uh, I suppose that is a, uh, one of the first beginnings of a particular kind of post-colonial stance uh, on Indian cultural practices that are that we cannot see the truth of anymore with our westernized eyes and minds and which would have a, a meaning uh, that uh, is opaque to us but which would carry real meaning to the widow who wants to immolate herself and to the family that allows her to do so. Uh, so, uh, it's a convoluted argument. It's the beginning, in a sense, of uh, post-colonial cultural studies. Right. And beyond that, I don't know what to say about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> The sort of complexity of the figure of consent has come up quite clearly. And uh, so, I mean, it was interesting when you were mentioning Prabhu's work on this. It seems like there's a, I mean, behind that sort of sense of um, when one is making a pledge, that one has sort of uh, assented within the form of a contract and thus is bound you know, to that sort of promise. I mean, there's other work also in which there's a discussion specifically of the, you know, how the understanding of what would be legitimate means to exit from that contract. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with the status of the various people entering into the contract prior to the contract and what kinds of uh, capacities they have to redress the breach of that contract. Mm -hmm. So if you look at stuff like, uh, like Robert Steinfeld and someone discussing the UK, this idea that you know, you, the laborers cannot uh, they have to be compelled to serve or in prison because they don't have the means to make a civil restitution. Whereas the people employing them can make a civil restitution, they can pay because they have the means to do so. So I mean, I was wondering, uh, it seems like there's a sort of complication in the way of looking at consent in that. Because I mean, otherwise you seem to get a figure of consent which is sort of contradictory and hypocritical and vague and one's not sure how it's actually operating. But it seems like one sort of consistent way of seeing it is that I mean, perhaps there's a requirement of law or the state to be able to regulate um, be able to regulate something like the right of refusal. Mm -hmm. And what refusals it cannot allow to be refused. So I mean it seems like that's one way to make sense of a lot of these kind of inconsistencies that I mean I mean the concept itself kind of throws them off. Um, and also, perhaps one way to um, trace a kind of movement from this kind of colonial law into similar kinds of, like, I mean, uh, he's mentioned Vina Das, like Vina Das' discussion of how women, when uh, women during independence being returned to India or Pakistan, and how that sort of figured in the constitution of the country and the law around that and the idea of something like a social contract, something like, you know, what could be refused and not be refused by women. Mm -hmm. Like what claims on them, and how law sort of encoded and regulated that, which is very different in a specific manner. Mm -hmm. But in this terms of, you know, who can refuse the refusal of another person, it seems to create a fairly clear um, trajectory in terms of this figure. And then, you know, to sort of look at some of these ideas of the capital norm and how that comes. And this is just something I was thinking as you were discussing.
I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last sentence. No, this is just something that sort of occurred to me in terms of how to make sense of this figure of consent because I couldn't quite see the relationship of the figure of consent to mm -hmm. this idea of the emergence of the counter norm and whether it's actually appropriate to leave law in terms of norms uh, in most cases. Mm. Uh, about the right of refusal or restitution, the uh, matter of restitution, uh, the sati when she takes the pledge uh, is giving something to the family and to her husband and to herself. And once she had made that promise and then she wants to rescind it, does she have the right to do that? Most of the cases that I refer to uh, relate to this timing really of not just the pledge but before and after the pledge. So can she, having pledged a certain act, a certain performance, which would uh, enhance the, uh, the ritual capital of the family, can she then take it back? Does she have the right to take it back? Or does she have to complete the performance in order to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, the, the uh, let the family have that? Uh, the matter of consent is of course larger than that. If she, no one would say, the scriptures would not say that she does not have the right to refuse at all. In fact, in 1817 there was a, uh, there was a very knowledgeable pundit who in fact said that she can retract her consent even after she had sworn a pledge. And the British accepted that but Judge C. Smith seemed to forget that and in uh, judgment after judgment, he would not allow her that. And I would, I would not push the contractarian analogy too far, but I thought that something of that kind of reasoning, out of which Smith and other judges came, many other judges came, would have reflected that kind of concern, without taking it absolutely literally, which, you know, the two contexts are so different that they can't. But the figure of consent features in very many other ways too. Uh, and what I was focusing on more are the effects of the bureaucratization and articulation and documentation and verification in public, which uh, does not actually uh, alter the form of sati or anything like that but it gives a kind of visibility to her consent and by implication to her unconsent when that happens, that was not possible in earlier times. And the fuzziness of the category of sati, that it could spill over into uh, characters who were not wives, who were not widows, who were not, uh, you know, uh, anywhere related to the sati, the true sati figure, uh, that's yet another. I mean, there again they want to perform this act. Though uh, scripturally the act does not carry any merit because it's only the widow, burning widow, who would acquire it. But still they want it. And then can we exceed scripture, exceed law, and grant them that right? So altogether there are many kinds of different ways in which the figure of consent is operating and I would not try to sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of catch them within a single pouch, catch them all within a single pouch. Okay, there's a yes, I, question. Yeah, I, I must say you've answered part of what I was going to uh, ask already in this last response. Um, I think it's very fascinating to be shown uh, this tissue of ambiguities and complications which surround the issue uh, and the discussions on, on certainty. Uh, but can this discussion of the issue of consent be taken further? Uh, because, uh, now you've clarified it somewhat, but otherwise it seemed to me that the example at the other end you were giving was the laws from the laws of money. And um, therefore which there was I'm sorry. the monastery. You mentioned. Which other examples? Well, of let's say a <coughs> consent being irrelevant. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. um, which would be then a counterposition of a prescriptive 
um, text with um, with actual historical processes with their messiness unfolding. And thinking on these lines, I wonder whether uh, the spiritual merit accruing to an act of sati in medieval times would be seen as in any way tarnished by the use of force. You know, I don't know this, and obviously medieval stuff is in <laughs> the documentation is of mm -hmm. different order. But what I'm saying is that can this issue of the display of consent also be seen as a theater of complications when one compares the colonial and the pre-colonial? Mm -hmm. And if one wants to explore the issue of consent, then normatively, what comes out of, let's say, the, um, the classical texts or the scriptures or figures like Gandhari and so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. So would that provide us one way of, mm -hmm. of thinking more broadly about the issue mm -hmm. of consent? I wonder what you think. According to scripture, uh, any uh, performance of sati would be tarnished by the use of force because it has to be completely voluntary. In fact, the sati has to insist on it. Uh, but in practice, uh, uh, there was no, uh, there was this condition, but there was no mechanism for verifying her consent. In fact, she does not even initially utter her consent. She uses a kind of a code. She picks up a twig of uh, a mango tree and sits down at the feet of her husband. And that's taken to denote her consent. Now this initiatory act is just witnessed by the family members. After that, uh, whether she, you know, her consent is sustained or not, and especially if her consent is sustained beyond the ascent to the pyre and the process of after the process of burning begins, no one could keep track of. So there is a great deal of literature among the colonial officials who stand around watching the sati with hawk eyes almost trying to detect till the last possible moment while there is still life in her, whether she is still resolute or not. And they all complain that it's impossible to see because the smoke is too dense, the sound is too loud because music is playing, and so on and so forth. And Ram Mohan also says that. What she feels, whether her consent remains with her or not till the bitter end, one cannot verify at all. And since one cannot verify at all. So all that time with ropes and being held down are customary features that were add on. And in fact, when Ramon points this out, Kashinath is speechless, he cannot retort. So under any circumstances, use of force would tarnish and it would not be a valid circle at all. So all the merit that is supposed to accrue to the act uh, would not be there. But whether one could establish consent beyond the point uh, is uh, another matter. And one of the arguments is that you cannot. Okay, we slowly come to an end. We have the last question. I think this is a, a bit of a, a, on a slippery pairing of the pairing thing. But I was just thinking about, again, the figure of consent and bureaucratization in the context of a, a different uh, realm of, like, for example, in special economic zones, but especially in urban areas on. Uh, urban renewal and resettlement and rehabilitation, uh, which is now generating a lot of uh, conflict. And I, I, I wonder what are your comments on that? Because there's a kind of a construction of how that is okay. It's got support from huge donor agencies, and there's a kind of a mythical figure of how once you have proper R and R, things will be fine. So I don't think that for comparing to the people that. Very often, even the landholder's consent is not taken or overridden. And secondly, even if the landholder's or landowner's uh, consent is taken, um, then what about the agricultural laborers who work on that land, the shareholders who work on that land, and whose needs and whose numbers vastly exceed that of the landowners? So uh, I think truly the two are not comparable. <laughs> Okay, 
Thank you very much for your fascinating talk and the discussion. Yeah. Thank you for the discussion. And um, well, are you going to? No, you don't want. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>